So, uh, Kevin, you said something you wanted to talk about that was like, yeah, oh yeah, only for you and thing. Paul, and not for me. So I'm just gonna sit on my hands. <laughs> well, it's also for you, Chad. But I don't think you'll. I don't, I don't know. Like, uh oh. Oh. I didn't want to. I didn't want to presume that you'd be excited for this. Um, but I, Kevin, I care about every single thing in your life that you care about. <laughs> okay. Well, I saw Rocky for the first time. Wow. <laughs> What'd you think, Kevin? I mean, that's fine. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> what an adorable uh, little independent romantic comedy. Right. Like. I did. I thought it would be because it's been like riffed on for like every sports movie ever. I yeah. didn't expect it to be like a sweet, like like soulful and full and full of heart. I, well, I didn't expect it to be like a like a um, Diablo Cody movie or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> was, I think <laughs> it's kind of like Rambo. Everybody thinks about Rambo. They talk about how many people get shot and destroyed, but in the first movie, that's not like the first movie is entirely different than. The rest of Rambo. Sure. And the same thing is true of Rocky, where there's this kind of nice and like quiet and contemplative little movie that's really down tempo, right? Yeah. And, and then it goes into what we all know in Rocky 2. Oh, okay. I, well, I don't know. Kevin, uh, so would you, say, would you say you liked it? I loved it. I like that Rocky goes to his shitty apartment and listens to chill anime beats to study and relax, too. <laughs> 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 He does. He cracks a whole egg in his mouth or in a cup. And yeah. Takes it. Is that is that the start of that trope? The 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 raw egg. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's definitely a scene in a movie. Well, like, I don't know. I know we always go on about fucking practical effects or whatever, but the fact that he's really punching meat and the fact that he's really drinking eggs uh-huh. and stuff because it's too low budget to not do any of those things, and it's too you know late 70s to have anything but practical effects it's just all so like charming and cool it makes me want to go out like right now right goddamn now with a camera and see what's interesting about my city you it's know? the it's the first movie to use uh uh the tracking camera like that the handy cam oh yeah that scene oh. where he's running through that like that marketplace was super cool as hell like where, he, where the guy throws him an apple yeah oh yeah that one's great can i just can i just share full disclosure because kevin i know you 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 invited me back in i i've never seen rocky what? Yeah, that, well, see, maybe I was right to exclude you, Chad. Sorry, I called it. <laughs> I called it handy cam. I meant, what I meant was steady cam. Ch- Chad, you gotta watch it. It's I know, it, Chad. I, I I think like you you might like it just because it's about two very awkward people who are in love and they yeah. and they find strength in each other. And I feel like that's just sort of a very like universal kind of message for anyone he, who's I don't, not not to not, not to re retcon my own history. I, maybe I did see that the new Beverly out here one time. I just feel like I've seen. All of the scenes in it, so oh. that I, you know. Also, Rocky loves his dog, and he loves uh, his two turtles, uh, and he loves. He has a fish named Moby Dick, and he <laughs> lets the fish hang out next to the turtles, but in separate like con- containments. But he implies that the fish and the turtles are friends with each other. <laughs> he's an animal lover, so he's like he's, he's a like, sweet person. He has his own menagerie, so I figured you might like that. But the funny thing is, he's that guy, but he also is a, he's also muscle for an Italian mobster. Yeah, and they never really, um, there's no, there's no real comeuppance for that. No. The comeuppance has already kind of happened where, like, Mickey, his trainer, is like, you know, I would have trained you, but you sold out and you started working for that loan shark. And Rocky's like, okay, well, I had to live. And that's kind of where it ends. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> yeah. There's never a, a beat where, like, the mob is like, hey, we now that you're big, Rocky, we're going to need you to, like, throw the match or something for us. No, the loan shark guy is, like, really supportive to him and shows up for the <laughs> for the boxing match and everything. Like, it's kind, of, it's kind of, he's just the reality of the the world Rocky lives in. And it isn't really hmm. commented on further. I think his friend is like terrible. His friend is like the worst like character in the whole thing. Oh, Paulie. Yeah, it's his brother. I thought right. Pa- it's no. it, it is. Uh, yeah, it's Adrian Adrian's brother. Yeah. Oh, it's Adrian's brother. It's, Adri- Sorry, okay. it's Adrian's yeah. brother. Yeah. Uh, he, he is. Uh, he's kind of a shitty dude, but that's. I think he's your uh, Rocky foil. The the yeah. the character that Rocky could have become. Yeah, I'm. I'm not saying he's a bad character. Like he's badly written. Or right, right, he's right, very, right. He's he's a very like interesting uh, character because like he's he has to sort of comprehend that he was the stable person in his family, and now everyone is moving so far beyond him because he kind of existed as the Rock before. Mm-hmm. But like you know, now his sister is moving in with Rocky, and like he doesn't really have any 
like prospects or reason to exist anymore and he's just kind of grasping to keep up with the world that's like outpacing him which is fun because you've certainly seen the scene from rocky 4 where rocky he gets a robot gives him a robot at his birthday and that is actually it's, it's funny to bring that scene up because in that movie paulie is becoming so disillusioned by his friend Rocky becoming so rich and so and so full of himself that he doesn't even know who Rocky is anymore. And the turning point is him gifting him a robot that sings you Happy Birthday. You bought me a robot, Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to bring Rock. about the, revo- the, the, the the doomsday Rocky. And he's like, it's a, it's a robot. <laughs> I did. I, I, so I, I also watched the first part of Creed, but fell off of it. Uh, oh, I've seen I've seen Creed. I think yeah. Creed does a good job of getting back to what Rocky was about, though. Maybe if I had watched the other Rocky sequels and they got away from what Rocky was about, but going right from Rocky to Creed, I'm like, I just kind of want to watch Rocky again. Yeah. It, yeah, Paul, you might be upset that I, I've only seen Rocky Balboa and Creed. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> I mean, Creed is cool, like how it recreates a lot of the shots from Rocky. Like, I think. I don't yeah. like they have the exact same like location shot where Rocky's gym was. Mm hmm. It was actually in my neighborhood where they well, the exterior oh, of that is in my neighborhood. Paul was birthed in one of those like bags of uh, 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 gym bags. <laughs> I actually, uh, Chad, I was a uh, birth from the seed of the apple that's thrown to him in that first steady camp. <laughs> You grew out of that. Rather than playing the trip. Um, that's why they call me Little Apple Boy in Philadelphia. <laughs> that's true. I was wondering why everyone was calling you that. Paul, you might you might know. Uh, I can't remember. We I think we talked about this last year. It was it was reported in the news that Rocky himself, uh, Stallone, was re-editing the movies and was going to what? take out. He took out the, the he scene did of Paul getting the robot. He did that. He took out the robot scene. That's fucked up. I man. know. That's re- like that's like George Lucas levels of messing with Star it Wars. Really is taking is. out the robot. It really is. Don't agree with it. Did he even direct that one? Uh, he didn't direct the first one. Oh, wait, right? sorry. He wrote the first one. He wrote the first one. Surprisingly robot free, but it does have Apollo Creed dressed up like George Washington mm. on on a float throwing money at people. Indeed. Which... Yeah. Put that on a dollar bill, you know? To, Put that. To Living in America by James <laughs> Brown, too. <laughs> And then he transforms into Uncle Sam with the announcers giving context for who Uncle Sam is for some reason. And Rocky is just standing there in a giant robe, just kind of watching him go. It rocks. Oh, wait, this is in the first one. I'm I'm sorry. I'm thinking of in Rocky Four. He does the coming to America. Oh, he's already he was already doing the American thing in the first one. Right. He was already like, I dress up like I'm a, a, a G.I. Joe character. Yeah. Carl Weathers. Yeah, Carl Weathers in the first one, like, and like after Rocky enters in in a robe, like a traditional boxer, like Apollo Creed enters in on like a sequin covered float with like a sexy Statue of Liberty, and like he's dressed up like George Washington, and then he gets off with like a big wig, and then he gets off of that into the ring where he's got another outfit on that's like a uh, Uncle Sam outfit, and he keeps like pointing at people in the audience and going, "I want you." Yeah, he just keeps uppercutting people in the audience. He goes out there and he just goes, "Ba bam." <laughs> He just uppercuts him. And then Rocky's like, someone's got to stop him. He's punching everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's not funny. <laughs> Chad, I, I, I don't know that you need to see the movie. <laughs> I don't think you have to see the movie. <laughs> He's gone crazy. He's just punching everyone in the audience. Yeah. Someone has to stop him. So you have seen it. <laughs> yeah, I have seen it. Rest in peace, Carl Weathers, by the way. Yeah. Oh man, he, what a kid! He was cool as hell. <laughs> I mean, he carries it through. Uh, don't yeah, don't you worry. There's a if you enjoyed Rocky One, there's plenty of more sexy Carl Weathers. Wow, man, the the beach <laughs> the beach run in in number four. Oh boy. Yep, yep. Seen that out of context, if you know what I'm saying. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool that you saw uh, Philadelphia's movie. Yeah, I feel like I have to go back to Philly now just because I, I I get it. I've now I... one okay so. Ne- so a big disparagement that a lot of people will throw us the stupidest disparagement ever disparaged is uh people will be like they worship rocky he's not even real what is better to worship than a myth a myth can never die <laughs> i mean you guys worship ben franklin who was real <laughs> that's true but like was he though but like was he uh, yeah, I mean, there is no... How about we start throwing that out there? How about we just start saying, like, just to really piss off the 1776 people, just be like, 
All the all those guys. Yeah, just be like those guys. <laughs> the founding fathers weren't even real. Those were just names on a paper. But you, you know, like you just do a whole kind of like Shakespeare's wasn't Shakespeare sort of thing. There's always a lighthouse, Chad. Yeah! <laughs> you see the new trailer for Judas? We're going to space! Is that where you're trying to take it? Was that the bit you wanted to do? Where you, no, you, you, want... <laughs> you took us into that space. I was no. not thinking about Columbia at all. Kevin, he's right. <laughs> no, he's right. You did that. I don't know. I don't know what, you, like, Chad's a master at, like, you know, at, at getting us to talk about Bioshock. So I figured I was just... Kevin, you're right. And you know what? I think, uh, fuck, Chad... Hold on a second, Chad. Uh, what? Do oh, not yeah. jump in because I know you're going to want to jump in. I think Chad might have somehow found a way to get us to talk about it without us even knowing. I think he might have chess moved us, Kevin, yep. into getting mm-hmm. us to talk about it. We're the victims here, Paul. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty cool in <laughs> Colombia that they worshipped the founding fathers like gods. That was a pretty <laughs> cool, terrifying idea. What a what a cool, perfect game that was. I had no problems whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, that's what you're always saying. You always, you always say that there's no nuanced take on it. That it's Dude, just the best I don't, game like, ever. Jude, like every Judas trailer came out, and it was like, oh, it looks like Bioshock Space. Like, yeah, sign me up. Like, put me in space again. I don't care that Troy Baker's even in it, and he can chill his <laughs> NFTs. Just like put me in that space again. Is he still? Did, did anyone tell him that we're not doing NFTs anymore? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I just assume at this point, if you're doing NFTs, you kind of still do it, but you just don't talk about it much anymore, mm. right? Like you don't. You don't you don't publicly announce I no longer do NFTs. You just quiet away. <laughs> yeah, everybody right now has their opportunity to slowly back away from NFT. Like the window ha- ha- has opened a-, a while ago. Now's the yeah. time to step away. You s- you see in Judas you get around by you jump inside a big robot <laughs> dog. It's a little a big old robot Clifford, a robot Clifford. You get in his head, he drives he takes you around. That's so cool. <laughs> I want to talk more about the Benjamin Franklin truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's more interesting. That was more interesting. I agree. Um, Talking about a, a a person who mastered lightning to use it as their weapon, Benjamin Franklin did that with the with his with only a kite. He didn't even have to use what what was the stuff called that they injected into themselves to make themselves magical? Pla- uh, pla- plasmids. Plasmid. He didn't oh, even have to use plasmid. In Columbia, yeah. What did they call? I should have known this. Plasmids was Bioshock One. Tonics yeah. or whatever. Tonics. Yeah, they probably had a. Yeah, he didn't even need that. He did it through the sky. But but what if he had a tonic? What if he did? Chad, is the Bioshock historian? Vigors. We're to- They're called Vigors. Vigors, that's it. Were, were Vigors, like, did they use the sea slugs from Bioshock? Or, like, how were they created? You know, it's funny. I Maybe there was a thing in the back. I wouldn't be surprised if there was, like, some lost concept art. Because I thought it was very cool that you understand that in Colombia... The reason why so many of the the thematic parallels are not just because there's always a lighthouse, yeah. as Kevin has said, <laughs> yeah. is that one of the scientists had opened a riff in, I guess, like space time and was mm. stealing blueprints from Rapture. Like yeah. one scientist was leaning his head and going, oh, cool. the big daddies, huh? Well, what if I made that a big bird instead? Mm-hmm. So I would not be surprised if some of the ingenuity of, of the vigor came from stealing from plasma. That is that statement that you just made uh, ruined any immersion that I could have possibly had in the series. Because I Why? know because I know for a fact that scientists and big wig politicians, they would not be original with their stealings they would simply exactly. steal the big daddy and put it in there but was that actually look at looking at the bioshock wiki right now it does say entirely unrealistic using the little test device jeremiah fink witness uh geneticist dr su chong in rapture in the creation of plasmids so he he took that idea and made vigors out of those so that is all that is and that's just what all these uh you know founders did man the industrialists that's all edison was doing he was just taking stuff and being like that's mine now Sure. That's right. I said it. He's got me. I said it. <laughs> He's got me. He's a master of debate. I did I did think the dog was cute, Chad. I just want to it's say. It's a very cute it dog. Looked like, it looked like the robo puppy for, that used to be in stores in 2004 or whatever. I know. And I like that the character Hope, she's like this cool lady, but her face is half robot. That looks really cool. I don't know. Um, I couldn't quite get into it because the girl who's in the trailer and then all the pictures looks like a Bratz doll and it kind of freaked me out. <laughs> They, the heads have gotten bigger since Elizabeth and Infinite. It's the heads little, are getting bigger every time. They're a little brat stolly. As long as they're not code Lyoko, I'm on board. Right? <laughs> That's the step too far. I'll deal with the brats. I won't deal with the Lyoko. Le- get those uh, get those French Canadian kids out of here. What the hell? What the hell is that, Lyoko? Oh, you don't know about code Lyoko? Yeah, good. We can talk about this for a minute. Uh, code Lyoko. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know. It was like a sci-fi <laughs> animated series that used some CG with 2D stuff. And uh, it was on Toonami for a while. And I thought it was an atrocious art style. I'm sorry, listeners who love Code Lyoko. Oh, it is a little it scary. Was really yeah. ugly characters. I hated, I hated it. It's the, uh, I always thought it was in the same genre as Reboot, a show you, I know that you love. How dare Jack, you? But <laughs> it is bad TV CG, so. It would also do bad CG TV, but like, it, yeah, Reboot, can I, can, can I say, Reboot, every episode, not only are they having to animate 22 minutes of CG animation, every episode is a new game. So they have to do like Mortal Kombat this time, which is like 20 new models and environments. <laughs> And and like now it's an Evil Dead game, and they do all that. They were killing themselves. Code Lyoko was just every time we get teleported to a random generic CG forest where one monster fights us, and it's the same monster every time. Very different. Very different. I'm sorry. I've alienated myself so much from everyone else listening. <laughs> I, I, I think Marcus Aurelius was the one who said, I, I'm not bound to have an opinion on Code Lyoko. <laughs> There's no compulsion for me to speak on Code Lyoko. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Goose Buds. Hello. I'm ma- I'm bringing us in. Welcome to Goose Buds. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Chad. I'm Paul. Hello, I am your junior host, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Some someday you're gonna get those wings, Kevin. Someday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm w- working my way up to the top. And uh, usually on this podcast, we give uh, R.L. Stein and other way books the hard-hitting critiques they deserve. In this episode, we are reading another R.L. Goosebumps Horrorland book, Robbie Schwartz versus Dr. Maniac. Mm. Or Dr. Maniac versus Robbie Schwartz. I forget the order. Dr. Maniac versus Robbie Schwartz. Robbie L. Schwartz? Oh. Robert Lawrence Schwartz, perhaps? No, it's R.L. Stein, guys. R.L. Stein put himself in a book. This was, they... certainly, <laughs> this was certainly the um, the the deepest look into R.L.'s creative process that we've ever gotten. <laughs> do it. Do we think this is an, as, an aspect of him? I think this is yeah. precisely they, how they, he they're works. They're both named Robert. <laughs> they're both Robert, and they both look at something and say, "That's a good title," and then they make a thing out of it. <laughs> They're always yeah. thinking of ideas. They're always getting ideas from just, you know, stuff that happens in life, you know? Like, I'll be walking around and I'll see something. I'll be like, hey, I could make a Goosebuds or a Dr. Maniac about that. <laughs> That's just what they do. They just swim you through start ideas. start name first and you fill in the gaps from there. That is kind of what Robbie does, isn't it? It is. Robbie is interesting because he is good at that and also has crazy hair. <laughs> Can I, this This book was so... Hyped up, I feel like, by some of the fandom. And me. You Wait, hold on. When did you hype this one? If you review the audio of the last couple of podcasts, I said the, that Dr. Maniac versus Robbie Schwartz will be good. Because it, it's about web comics. Yeah, it's about a web comic <laughs> guy. But you know what? He doesn't even seem to be fucking publishing them anywhere. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Which is a no that that's a noble thing to do is to make a comic on your computer and put it nowhere. Or or is he publishing them on the multiverse? <laughs> okay. I think I know what you're getting at. Yeah. Think um, about it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we all know what Paul meant by is he publishing them on the multiverse? But yeah, Paul, I would you would think you about unpack it. that thought? Think about it. <laughs> well I can't. <laughs> It hurts, I, Paul. I, I, I think I could make a reach for it, but I want to hear Paul explain No, no, explain no. no. We'll, t- we'll explain it as we go through, baby. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. So this is this is not a good this book. Is, no, but... this is one of the this is one of the worst books. There's there's a bevy of of proof within this book that nobody cared about it whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and I am prepared to provide that proof. I, I think I have my angle for this. I was talking with you guys in chat about uh, losing hope and feeling like <laughs> I would devolve into yet another round of nihilistic existentialism, having read this book where everyone is mean to each other and there is no kindness or caring. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think th- I think this book is a cry for help from R.L. <laughs> Stein. From R.L. Stein. And I can I, I'm I'm going to attempt to lightly psychoanalyze Stein okay. uh, throughout this, okay. and I think I think this is him asking for us, the Goosebuds in particular, okay, to kill him, to f- help him. <laughs> well, I also think this 
style, which we'll get into, but he is just trying to write a shorter and shorter thing. Like everything he does <laughs> is he doesn't want to write anything at length. He just wants to make a shorter and shorter experience. He's trying to condense it down to its 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 atoms to just put it out there. He's like, if I can keep wasting time by continually inserting first acts in there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. if the book never starts it's never bad yeah yeah it's it's just he's playing for time well uh the 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 first two fake outs of this book being it was just one of my comics oh no and then it russian nesting dolled into another comic uh oh my god both of those allowed him and I'm going to argue the third one and maybe even the fourth one uh, allowed him to write something bad and say, it's just a kid's comic book. It's supposed to be bad. And that is the nihilistic angle that I have to take on this one. Yeah, no, I I, I think that is something we should dive back into. And I want to keep somehow Kevin, you're searching for hope in the darkness. But I, I just want to I just want to make sure we're not jumping um, too far over the gut punch. That is this double or triple, triple triple act turn of you're reading multiple chapters i think before the first one turns of like oh I, I'm, I'm writing these comic books and then i think i saw one of my villains is here and he attacked me and he's eating a squirrel I'll, oh i i i really just want to set the record straight i am not searching for hope or light here <laughs> um i'm okay. not that's i'm not that stupid i am searching for an explanation Okay. I'm searching for what he's trying to say through his anguish, but uh, I also want to to do the reveal a little early and say this book is uh, oops all fake outs like it's nonstop fake even outs. into it's, it's, it, the fake out even bleeds into the horror land portion of this book another section <laughs> that is completely useless I, I just like I, I don't know I, I don't know who's who's telling RL that stuff is great. I don't, I don't think know it, if it's his editor. I don't know if kids are coming up to him at like Barnes and Noble because this is 2008 and that was a thing. You know who's telling him? The U.S. Mint is telling him that these are great. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie L. Schwartz is a young man who makes a web comic. Sam is the middle kid in his family who's his younger brother. And Taylor is his little sister who's adorable and can do no wrong. Right. Um, Robbie sucks and everyone hates him. <laughs> Robbie is Robbie's only defining feature is he has crazy hair that he cannot that he cannot tamp down. Now this bit of this nugget of in, interesting character development will carry him through all the iterations of this story so that we are sure to know we are dealing with Robbie. Robbie's dad is bald and that is makes him worthy of derision. <laughs> 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 Robbie Robbie refers to his father as a pink egg. <laughs> he's so he's so mean, uh, and everyone is mean to him. His dad also spits water at him for yeah, reasons. And he tells him it's a trick, but really, it's just we know a way for him to blow off a little steam at Robbie, who is a complete asshole. This accidental birth child that he didn't want to have, and he had to bring into this world. He's just like I'm gonna spit water on him all the time. Well, he made that mistake two more times, so I mean, I guess he's not yeah. Married. Well, at that point, is you're just well, I'm already here. Um, but again, I, we're talking about all these traits like they matter, and uh, they don't. <laughs> just, just, to, just to like really listener. Because I know you didn't read this book, and God, I wish I lived in your world where you didn't read this book. <laughs> it is, it is. I think at least twenty pages of like, oh, I guess this is the adventure, and we understand he does web comics, and then wouldn't you believe it? He he goes out into the woods, uh, and they're on a camping event, and then he sees Doctor Maniac, and Doctor Maniac kids, kidnaps Robbie. Fake and out. He has to defeat. He had to defeat the Purple Rage, a, a totally original villain that is not just the Hulk with a cape. It's it's fake out. It's all a comic strip. It's all a comic it's strip. And here, here's how little anybody cares about this. Even the Wikipedia, <laughs> or sorry, Goosebumps wiki writers didn't even yeah. write the second fake out into the plot <laughs> synopsis of this book. They You're just right. skipped it and went into the story of the book because it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> So anyway, you're like after you're like fifty pages into this. I'm just making numbers call. You're, you're like fifty pages into this book, and yes, you understand that Robbie likes making comics and that his friends are aware of them. But at this point, I don't care anything else RL has to tell me. I don't care anymore. Like I, I'm not trying to be nihilistic. I don't believe anything's real, and not in a fun like Inception way. 
I'm just going, well, when are you going to do it again, RL? Oh, man. Are you do it at the end of the goddamn book, you piece of shit? I feel like you guys are going through exactly what I was going through a few episodes ago when I had my first <laughs> major breakdown about the works of RL Stein, where I was just like, it's it, it's nothing. It's the, like it's a meaningless world where everything sucks. <laughs> we're going through we're going through these horror land books, and it has been a yeah. marked shift. It has been a marked shift in in I, 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 like I, it's crazy to say because I never thought that the original books were all that great to begin with. <laughs> like, sure, there were some good ones, and yeah. there are and there are moments, but. It felt. It's crazy to say, but it felt like he was trying at that point. No, something has happened. The the ghost writers. He's paying less. I don't or think something. No, I don't think there's ghost writers now. Now, yeah, I think we're in pure Stein territory, and I think what we're dealing with here is he's just pumping these out, and he's pumping <laughs> out a 100 page, or maybe a a 90 page Goosebumps book where he, where he does <laughs> where he does he does it's it all they are. It's like the, in the 90s, remember all the CDs came out with greatest hits because bands were like, wait, we can just make free money if we put this all out on the CD yeah. as the greatest hits. That's what he's doing yeah. here with each of these books. He's bringing back whatever worked in the last ones, whatever books sold. This is them. Attack of the Killer Mutant very much, but, yeah. like, bat, but a worse version with, of Attack and, of the Killer With a little bit Mutant. of uh, the, ha the Haunted Mask and some other stuff in there, right? Um, yeah. And it, it, the problem is it's all in service of building these characters for this expanded universe narrative that he's trying to build <laughs> which which okay i'll say this I i'm gonna try and say a couple nice things occasionally about this yeah <laughs> this one yeah. first off <laughs> doing it before it was extremely popular and mcu had pulled it off fully he was trying to create a connected universe of his books yeah yeah cool you didn't. Do you think? He, do you think he mutters that all the time? By the way, do you think like when his kids go see like an Iron Man, he's like, "I came up with this idea first. Absolutely, I had I had an idea. They all hung out. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it, but it doesn't matter because the story is so inane, and he, there are so many kids that he's starting to uh, disappear kids within that story just so that he can fit in more kids that will disappear. I, I'm assuming. <laughs> I'm assuming there's going to be an Avengers moment at some point in this thing. Oh maybe. my God. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, instead of, instead of cap on your left, it's like, I fell on my knees and let out a groan. <laughs> we'll have a bunch of generic <laughs> children that we remember. We remember no traits for. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm trying to say something nice there and I'll say something nice <laughs> about, I'll try and say something. I don't think you succeeded, nice. Paul. Was there anything think... nice in that at all? I, 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 think you made, I think you made a neutral statement, <laughs> which is the worst. Okay, you're right. I did make a bit of it. I'll, I'm gonna... But that's fine. I don't. You don't need to, man. Just let it out. Like, well, no, I, no. I, 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 I thought I was going to come in here and be like the goofy guy, but I feel like I'm the anchor of this episode. You guys are like... <laughs> You guys are I, keep like about, I keep thinking about it. listeners of our podcast. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening for Goosebuds. We are, uh, but there's people who listen to this podcast who are like, I love RL and I love his books. You know what? There's something in these that we also loved, but RL needs help right now. Yeah, RL does not. RL said himself, I do not write from the heart. I would never give anyone the advice to write from the heart. If you love Goosebuds, you love it more than RL Stein does because he does not put his heart into this. Right. <laughs> That is a Bam Margera quote. is drinking, and we need to we need to either help Bam, <laughs> or we need to close him off so that he gets the help he needs. We are we are the jackasses, and I don't know why I made this. I don't know why I made him Bam Margera. <laughs> that, that was such a that was a choice, ref. I think my, about my Bam Margera a lot, and how he's descending into chaos and misery. I think about him a lot. I think you'd be happier if you didn't think about Bam Margera. <laughs> Probably, I shouldn't. Yeah, I just got to say, as the kids say, this ain't it, Chief. That's all I got to <laughs> say about this. He tries to do this fake out thing, and I want to give him, I want to try and say there's benefit of the doubt that he is trying to do something and trying to say something with this uh, recursive nesting story, and I wanted to believe that there was going to be a point made at the end of it, but that is why we're having these nihilistic <laughs> existential breakdowns, because you get to the end, and there's simply nothing there. I wonder if you're doing the same thing I do when I'm when I'm reading these now too. Again, I am looking for hope and dark and light and darkness when I'm reading these, and and I'm like, okay, well, I, I I'm like a, I'm like 50 pages in. I, I kind of understand the premise of this. This is a character's a, a kid's creation has come alive somehow. His comics are coming to life. Well, that's somewhat interesting. That's been done in interesting stories. And, My mind races to and maybe, to uh, go ahead. And maybe it's something along the lines of 
and this is what I thought he was going to go with if he wanted to try and say something. But again, uh, he does not. He does not want to say anything, as Kevin said. <laughs> he, he could have been like, oh, it's like sometimes you're writing something and the character comes to life without you knowing. And that is when, when you know you've tapped into your creative instinct and you are going yeah. purely in the, in the state of flow because you're, you're, your characters come to life and act without you. Maybe that's what he was trying to say. No, no, no. <laughs> he, he fakes us out at the end. All to tell a joke. It's all a big joke. There's like one tiny speck of speck of potential that I don't even know if he meant to at this point. But it was that early on is established and we should try to outline the plot of this book. Okay, uh, before we but, do, though, before yes. we do, I'm sorry. I know I, I, I know we want to get back to the plot, but I have to. Th- I, this question is boiling okay. uh, underneath the surface for me. And yeah. I, this was kind of the cause of my uh, like nihilistic existential breakdown <laughs> earlier, but you two are both creative people who make things, and I am a creative person who makes things as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. When you picture yourself as an older person <laughs> who is creative still and makes things still, do you think the stuff you make is better? Like, I have to imagine that I will get better at what I do oh, damn. the older I get and the more I do it. But even just seeing like RL just like slowly get worse <laughs> through like <laughs> original Goosebuds to Goosebuds, uh, original Goosebumps to Goosebumps 2000 to Horrorland, it's another reminder that success isn't a straight line, but it isn't necessarily a, a thing that averages up either. Yeah, he's the opposite of a super Saiyan. S- S- he's getting weaker after every after every fight. Wow. I, I think he's getting worse, and I think he knows it too because there's some. There's some signs in this that he's uh, he's coping. Okay, I it's one well, Kevin. A little bit of trivia from the uh, Goosebumps Wiki page. Did you know that in 2013, R.L. Stein <laughs> said that this is his favorite book of all time? That's insane. <laughs> That's insane to that's say. A, that's another data point for me. I thought his favorite was the RL was the haunted mask, like the original oh, haunted favorite mask. modern Goosebumps. Book. Favorite I'm sorry, modern, I'm sorry, okay. modern. I apologize on okay. Twitter, which also like I don't know, was he just like what book is in front of me? Is it Doctor Maniac? But Dr. Robbie, Maniac. Robbie is him, right? right? And this we is agree his, that yes, it is, and and it's and I think it's <sighs> it is. Uh, I don't know if he's an only child. It'd be interesting to find that out. Um, we, I have considered that we should read his uh, autobiography at some point. We probably uh, should. It came from Ohio, which yes. I, I read as a kid. I think it w- there could be some interesting uh, psychological data points, as you said, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, could, just another. Could... Okay. Like, I, like this book, I was wondering how to take it until I realized that I'm not RL's friend and I am not his fan. I am his therapist. <laughs> I am, I am putting together... What he is trying, what he is like, he's telling me what he's doing, and I'm trying to put together why he's doing it, like right. why this is actually a thing. Because at this point, he's a rich man; he can write whatever he wants. Like he could do anything, and he chooses to do a self-insert <laughs> sort of story about himself. And he includes a lot of interesting things. Like, uh, are, can we get to the point with the banana in the ear joke? Yeah, sure. Oh man, yeah. Okay, sure. The, do you guys that, do you guys remember this part? Did it I, stick out to you? I, I did because uh, just in case this overlaps for anyone, uh, Film Cow's Charlie the Unicorn has an entire song uh, about putting a banana in your ear. Wow, it's okay. much a non sequitur thing, and it's very catchy. Go check out Charlie the Unicorn if you haven't. The, he got okay. Weird that's at the a end. great. That's a yeah. sorry, real quick. That's a great touch point for this because this entire that is the lol random humor that was popular at the time. Uh, this whole book feels like low random humor but like what? charlie unicorn's funny though like you know what I, mean? like, like, I don't know maybe you might disagree but there's like oh, fun characters and nuance in yeah, these i like this it. is purely uh spork Ugh, like kind of stuff right but do you guys remember how the banana in the ear joke goes yes he doesn't actually say the joke like wait maybe i don't know line. maybe i don't know uh there's a guy with a banana in his ear and someone asks how'd you get a banana in your ear and he answers, I can't hear you. I have a banana in my ear. Yeah, he did say it that way in the book. Okay, so the the subtext of that joke is that people <laughs> are unknowable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what RL is saying with this <laughs> little example is that when people are ridiculous, sometimes there is a wall between you and them. That blocks out all understanding. Mm-hmm. 
You cannot communicate. You cannot communicate with the person with the banana in the ear because the banana is the thing that prevents you from talking to them. Kevin, I like what you're saying, but I also will counter with: What if he just put the joke in there because he thought that joke is funny? No, you, you know what? That is what surface level RL would do, right? <laughs> but yeah. there, there is. I, I think. Like, you cannot gaze into the art abyss without the abyss gazing back a little bit. Sure. And there is a subconscious desire for RL because he do protest too much, I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. about not putting his heart into things that I think somewhere in the back of his anxiety ridden mind, there is like this artist character in his head and that wants to express ideas and emotions and things. Can I can I go back to something you asked a minute ago, Kevin? I, I'm curious, Paul, how you feel about this, but like you asked about... Uh, as creatives, does the work get better? I I think personally, every time I write, I get better at writing. Yeah. Um, but I think I also do it's something I find with. I get a little more cynical about like the creative process and the industry and compromises you make. And so you you're getting stronger, but also you're like you're trying to hold on to your younger passion of like yeah. Oh well, you know, don't don't, don't get too excited about the story because the, the executives are going to go like what would a character ever walk that way like you know and then you go well okay we'll tell this story then that level is a constant battle as a creative but i do think i get stronger as a creative uh as i've gotten older i don't know about you paul or kevin i think i agree with that but i will say that we have a hard time judging that because really if if, yeah we don't know that many artists outside of the artists who are widely successful right and we can only really judge the art of people who have had pretty massive success or moderate success and i think when you look at that, those people who have had massive success, once they've had that massive success, have a set of parameters put on them that you and I, or the three of us, will not, unless we have that level of success at some point. And I wouldn't say, we've all had varying different kinds of success, but I wouldn't say any of us have ever, we've never had, we've broken into mainstream success, right? With our art. Yeah. So for us, we we are just kind of content to keep doing the next thing, knowing what we know from the last thing. and carrying it forward right i i think like the idea of the working artist the artist who maybe never hits it big but gets to continue like plying their trade and practicing their craft and stuff like it, it's rare to know it in our specific fields like we kind of lack elders there but mm-hmm. i see it in other fields like i see it in uh music For sure. especially i, I yeah. see folks who are lifelong musicians they don't like tour or, or anything like that yeah and maybe they have another job or something but I'm I'm starting to try and dig up those people more and more to have that idea of what an older, like, creative person's life is like. That's a good point. And, you know, there are people like that. Like, if I'm just instantly um, pulling someone out, like Brian Eno, one of my favorite artists, right? Yeah. Or uh, Shinya Tsukamoto, a Japanese filmmaker. Very, very weird guys that have made very weird art. Those are two very sh- disparate characters. But they're both very kind of similar in my mind. And I think they're kind of fitting the mold of what you're talking about, which is... But again, yeah. I, I would argue that both of them have had very high successes and have and have touched uh, large audiences, uh, sure. es- especially Brian Eno. But Brian Eno has constantly reinvented himself throughout his See, entire that's what career. I, that's what I worry about my own work is like, you know, I've only been doing what I like. I've only been making games for 10 years, but I find myself leaning on like stuff that I know that works and. I I wonder sometimes if it makes me less er experimental and makes me and like is like kind of torpedoing my own growth or if I do the opposite, if I'm constantly innovating, do I have no style? Sure, right. sure. I mean, and I, I think there's also a level uh, for any of these people are you, you start to get kind of like pigeonholed in certain class as as an animation writer. I know you can get uh, pigeonholed as an animation writer. Mm-hmm. You can get uh, set in certain genres of, oh, you you write horror action or you write preschool stuff or you do this. Like, this is your thing. And it becomes harder to step out of it, even if you have skills otherwise, which is both like, yeah, you're hiring people who are the best at what they do. So you kind of want to segment folks, but it does curb process. I think part of, to bring this back to RL, yeah. to see if you guys feel about this otherwise, is why I'm usually, a, I'm personally a little bit harder on someone like RL, that's just because we have a podcast dedicated to them, is these are the rare cases, it seems, where they do have what feels like creative freedom to do what they want. Of like maybe I mean, yeah, there's maybe Scholastic is like we're not going to put out a, a, a hardcore erotica novel RL, but if RL <laughs> wanted to, he could reach out to Adam and Eve and do that for himself, right? You know right, what I mean? like right. He, could, he 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 has the resources. It's like um uh being John Malkovich, right? Like yeah. 
like being John Malkovich and then using uh, that power to be like, I want to do marionettes now. Mm-hmm. It does give him that ability to do so because he has the resources and the clout and the fame versus, well, you got to do another uh, edgy, uh, you do another like artsy movie, Malkovich. It's, I don't know if that, that metaphor makes sense at all. No, it does. And I think that what, what I, I guess to my point of what I was saying about we see, we, ha- we have a hard t- harder time looking at artists who are not as successful in like studying their work. We have plenty of, of examples of that, but I think with someone like RL, he instantly had a breakout hit with Goosebumps and he just kept going at it. Well, I mean, he did write Fear Street and stuff before. And yeah, right, it, was, right. it, it, it wasn't like totally instant. Like he had struggled and he wrote like joke books and like, totally. stuff. Totally, yeah. But, he, but he, when, he, when he did have his success, it blew up and he saw the opportunity to make a lot of money. And I think- that is what is really disappointing about reading more and more of these is like we're just getting in, it's just getting del- more and more diluted and more and more cash grabby because his like, only metric for success is how much money he makes right that uh, seemingly well you would you'd like to think that like there's some level of chasing awards or i don't isn't don't you think like being a quote master of horror you would be like I get really excited that like the the book really scared some kids, or you know, or well, he I, compares himself. To, he doesn't give a shit about the kids. He compares he, himself to Stephen <laughs> King. <laughs> no, but Stephen King clearly cares about the craft more a little. No, bit. but like that's not what he compares himself to Stephen King on. He compares himself with page count and book releases. That's where he compares himself <laughs> to Stephen King. Is he's yeah. like I have output, I make money, therefore I am the greatest author of all time like he has like, a shelf in his house somewhere and if i got, if i keep filling it with books with my name on it i'll become a god maybe and, like, and, maybe and, <laughs> and it's there's like there's a little bit of like a writerly wisdom in that and like just keep writing you know just keep yeah. trying and keep churning stuff out and you know eventually something you know to to your point kevin you'll stare into the art abyss long enough and the abyss will speak <laughs> back and there will be something to report Right, right. Well, so shouldn't there shouldn't there be by the, at this point we we're we're gonna keep going. We're gonna keep going. Of I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold this boat to the, we're I'm strapping you to this train that goes down the RL career, and <laughs> at some point we're gonna hit a good one. We gotta. But I think I think that's <laughs> I think we're hitting on why RL scares me. You know why I had that <laughs> breakdown, which is because I think if as long as I have time, as long as I can keep doing this, like finding ways to keep like the ball in the air and like keep making games and releasing them and being creative. I think I'll get better. And I think I'll get close to making that like dream, like knockout amazing video game one day. But as RL shows, you can't just like show up and and get like the attendance <laughs> award or, or anything like that. Cause, but also you can, cause it's working. You know what I mean? Like it's, no, no, it's just, it's how you define success. He's not, yes, he is not trying yes. to make the best thing ever. He is trying to have page count. He's like trying to have like uh, book releases and money. Like that's the only two metrics he cares about. I'll be extremely generous. I think he has, ki- he had kids and he was like, I am going to provide so fucking much for these kids. I'm going to make so much <laughs> yeah. goddamn money that they were, are yeah. going to have the most perfect lives that I can afford to give them. And that is going to be the most positive thing that I will say about his goals. Dr. Life. Maniac is his second child's braces or something like, <laughs> right, right. Like yeah. this, this, yeah. this series, the Goosebumps Harland series paid for his kids college probably. Right. Like, <laughs> I, Pro- yeah. Uh, can and, we and bless him if he can, could provide that for his kids? <laughs> sure, sure. But he also could make the books a little bit better, uh, or he we're... could be an accountant, or he could write ad copy. <laughs> well, at this or point something. he could retire, but you know, yeah. yeah. Do you, I mean this is a whole? Do you guys ever like have a moment where you see a certain celebrity who definitely has enough money still doing stuff? I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, I saw like Jennifer Aniston is doing ads for some food delivery service. I'm like, I know that you should have enough uh, money. I think I can answer that for actors and i think it's because they need to continually do some sort of acting work to get uh to get their keep their sag well i guess uh, their sag after well, insurance yeah. rates but sure i don't even know commercials count for that to be honest well i think it's also to uh i forget who i was watching uh maybe future kevin if he feels like it will put in what i was thinking of but it was you know it, i think it was about why larry david did that like crypto commercial or whatever oh uh-huh. sure and and it's because you know you show up and you're a you're a high profile actor in a in a commercial on set and everyone treats you like you're a fucking god and yeah. everyone like is super nice to you and like you, you get a million dollars you get a yeah. million dollars you get all your demands met it's like a it's like a fun breezy week of shooting or whatever and then it's done and that's why they do it because they make it really easy to do it. Sure, sure. 
yeah, and just, you it, feel like a star. <laughs> and and it's getting a little tighter now because before, I mean, you know, I, we all know the famous Japanese commercials that used to be, uh, you know, used to be, uh, you didn't see them before because there was no internet, right? Right? Yeah. But yeah, like then, yeah. but then the internet came out, and it was like, did you see that fucking Tommy Lee Jones has been making commercials over in Japan for decades? And we're like, what? My favorite are the. Um... Uh, the 24 Jack Bauer uh, yeah. commercials in Japan. Yeah. yeah, and we saw all that stuff and we're like, this is what people have been doing. These guys have been under our noses doing crap over somewhere there, else. Yeah, there has been a cultural shift and this is maybe off topic now. I mean, we already off topic. <laughs> but like, of it, the shame of a high profile celebrity or spokesperson doing a commercial in America is no longer a problem, right? right. You just it, like, ah, well, maybe they'll lend their voice to this ad. Now it's just like, whatever. They'll shill for whatever you, you want. We we used to have this idea of, like, uh, uh, artistic authenticity, and um, we had this idea of, like, the slacker who was still authentic or whatever. And we used to have all this stuff, but, like, we don't have slackers anymore, and we don't have uh, l- this idea of authenticity because everyone needs to work a million gigs. We understand why actors would do something, like, in Japan or whatever, because they need to make money. Everyone needs to make money. Yeah, none, so, of, their, none of their friends will see it and make fun of them for it, yeah. for being silly. <laughs> Product placement became so common that and so expected that we've yeah. all legitimacy has been destroyed right because now even the youtube <laughs> yeah. channels and the tiktok stars that you watch they're doing these things right in front of you uh like i remember when we first started doing continue stuff and we got offered those things the like literal discussions about being like should we do something like this is that fun? Yeah. weird to do that you know and like we did a couple and then we were like and we didn't get offered that many more. But <laughs> yeah, well, like we were, you know, like not to not to like reveal too much about the the backstage of Goosebuds or whatever. But we were offered an opportunity like that to like pitch a product or whatever, and we were into it. But like the returns were not that good, and none of, none of us really liked the product. No. It wasn't it's, worth it wasn't worth selling your yeah. your name to it. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's like it's if we're gonna thing. do this, then like you know, let's do it for Mountain Dew Code Red or some <laughs> shit. Like yeah, right. probably we could stand behind. Um. So Robbie, <laughs> he's okay, back. yeah, he's got us okay, back. So, in. so Ro- Robbie's telling us about the Purple Rage, a character <laughs> he invented, uh, who's mad all the time, uh, who says stupid, random, lol, random stuff. Oh my, oh, yeah, and his and his the Purple Rage's statements, yeah, don't even make sense. I don't. I guess they're lol, random. I, yeah. I was screenshotting them a little bit as we went through them. They they they're alliteration a little bit. They're like, you know, it really pummels my pound cakes. Yeah. Uh, or whatever. Like, okay, yeah, I guess like your pancakes would get pummeled. I guess that'd be a thing you'd be mad about. And then like halfway through the story, the purple rage stops doing the alliteration device in that trip. <laughs> yeah, he just gets <laughs> fucking bad. He just he just or he's like, yeah, you know what anger? You know what rem- Remy's? R- I can't even do it. You know what riles my j- Jimmy's? Yeah. You know what really grinds my gears? Peter, yeah. Peter Griffin voice. Yeah. But at least grinds my gears is alliter- alliteration, right? You all understand. So it's like, did does, does the Purple Rage not care anymore? Did RL not care anymore to write an alliteration phrase? Uh, which is like such a comic book thing, right? By like the, the hoary hounds of Hogarth or whatever. Like from right. Doctor Strange. These are things you say. Yeah, I think he's like ch- kind of riffing on like the old like TV Batman like J- jump in Jiminy's radioactive man or whatever like yeah it? this is definitely super even though this is 2008 and iron man is about to come out and change everything uh this is <laughs> very much superhero set in the like adam west version of batman well and that's Thank the thing is he, he's having like a good time seemingly i don't even know if he's having a good time i don't think he's having a good time at all <laughs> Uh, he he ostensibly is having a good time revisiting the comics that he loved as a child, but then he's so dismissive. It doesn't even seem like he's like drawing from anything that he loves about them. He's just being like, look how stupid comics are and they rot your brain, you know? And like, we're, we're, well, we're, Go ahead. Well, from his same snake mouth disparaging <laughs> video games with mentions of battle chess, which is chess with guns, and being like, my brother who's fake is a total game freak. And and being like, you know, uh, comics and uh, superheroes are cool, but video game chess is stupid. Right. Which, it, by the way, I think I, I battle chess is a real game. I don't know if RL knew that. Sometimes he does intentionally reference like the X Men because he's yeah. like battle chess is chess with guns. That sounds sick. He did yeah. not. Yeah, he did. Obviously, he got he if he did know about battle chess being real, he did not do the research to find no. out that 
It's fantasy based RL. Battle chest is lords and swords and mist and magis- magics. Yeah, there's blood <laughs> in it because they chop arms off and stuff. It's cool. That's cool. Uh, I, I I think I think the overarching thing about this book that really bugged me was, and it, it, <laughs> it, it, it's something that that is pervasive throughout all of RL's work, but it has especially become pervasive in these books. And I wonder if it has something to do with maybe who's editing the books or who's working with. There is a uh, there's a, a a bit of a cynicism, a, a cynicism that I mm-hmm. think was very prevalent in the '90s. Uh, and and a little bit of the probably the eighties as well. I wasn't alive in the eighties to ex- to experience it, but especially in the nineties, this kind of cynical. Kevin, you you pointed at it earlier. I'm not really trying cynicism, yeah. but also Paul, this is two thousand eight. I know. I know. This was published in October two thousand eight, and I wonder if people who grew up in that lo- that those layers of cynicism and irony uh, were not helping him make these things, and maybe advising and saying. Don't try. If you try too hard, kids will know you're trying. So if you mm-hmm. don't try, it will be better and they will find you funnier by you're you're not trying. They'll know it's dumb and that you think it's dumb and they won't think you're like trying to win them over. That's the like vibe I get yeah. of everything that he's doing here is this is a person being like it's all really stupid, right? And looking at you the whole time. It's funny is what you're describing, and I and I pick up that vibe too. It really, you could really read it between the lines without having to read that hard. Uh, is it feels like the opposite of, do you remember when Conan O'Brien retired for the first time? Yeah. And he had this really great speech about like just encouraging young people to be like genuine and earnest Don't and be not cynical. be cynical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And whatever reason it stuck with me that was a really great I, way to look at look at things creatively. that was one of the most beautiful speeches i've ever seen on television not that there are a lot of great speeches on television no but, but yeah but it was like, like in a time where we were all like this man seems to be getting screwed out of his deal and he could be cynical and he's he's doing this very earnest thing this is great uh rl's doing the opposite and then wouldn't you know what i think in this book there's a conan o'brien reference like, yeah okay so let's get to the main universe all right okay <laughs> Let's, Sounds good. So after a million fake outs, uh, we get to the main universe where we zoom out yet again, and uh, it's Robbie's friend Brooke, his totally real uh, younger brother Sam. Uh, Brooke is an elf, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's short and she has a pointy nose or something like that. And yeah, uh, Brooke and Sam want to play battle chess on Robbie's laptop. So he goes downstairs uh, for uh, the, the, some Doritos. And then when he comes back upstairs, <laughs> Dr. Maniac has taken Sam. Oh, my God. The police have to show up. And uh, we do get we do get one amazing bit out of this. Like, not not amazing enough to justify any anything that's happening here. Okay, let's hear it. Uh, but we do get Jerome. Uh, Jerome is just hilarious because Sam yeah. has gone missing. The police have been called. The police show up and they're like, don't worry, Robbie's parents. We found your son. And they pull a random child named Jerome into the house and say, here he is. We found a kid on a bike. This has to be him, right? Yeah, and and it, it, Jerome says, no one believes kids these days. I'm not, I'm, I don't live here. This isn't my house. Let me go. Jerome and, is profiled by the cops. Yeah. He is kid profiled. He's like, I was just walking my bike and I got dragged here. You know, we always hate it when the parents don't believe the kids. And this is what entirely what this book is doing. Well, I thought, yeah, I, and I, I don't disagree with you, Kevin. I think this is, I'm trying, I'm looking, I'm looking for anything interesting in this book. <laughs> I can't recall too many other Goosebumps stories where not only is the kid missing, the parents believe the child is missing. I think it'll, in like 95% of the other of these stories, yeah. the parents would go, oh, your brother's missing. He probably just played, he probably just ran off and played with his friends. He'll be back tonight. Oh, oh, Robbie, you should make up stories. Instead, yeah, the missing persons report is filed. Like, I can't think of too many times the cops have come in this regard in a Goosebump story. Yeah, but that doesn't matter because we're gonna go see. Uh, <laughs> that <laughs> didn't do nothing else in this story. They disappear. No, th- yeah, that doesn't matter because uh, uh, Robbie sees on TV the, the Purple Rage talking to Conan O'Brien. I mean Red Martinson, and uh, it's like I gotta go down to the TV station because this show is recorded live and it's a local show. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this this town is bursting with entertainment. The best part about this moment is the worst part is uh, <laughs> that he sees him on TV, goes to his parents and says, Mom, Dad, one of the comic characters to prove to you that Dr. Maniac stole my brother, which you don't yeah. believe me. You just think he's missing. One of the other characters that I wrote is on TV. Come in. And let me show you. They go inside. 
and the and what is this thing called? The purple what? Purple rage? Purple, purple, rage. Ra- purple, purple rage. rage. Purple rage. Purple rage. Is that a purple rain reference? Maybe. Uh, I never. I did not even think about it because there's nothing prince like at no, all. Oh, I, w- I didn't go another step because I knew R. Eldon. It took like, me. <laughs> I hadn't said. <laughs> Why that seems like a Bible quote. I didn't go another step because R. Elton. He wasn't going to think about it a step beyond purple rage, so I wasn't either. Yeah, I, I didn't think of it until I said the words purple rage out loud for the first time, which, which was just then. Uh, so, that, could, that could be a cool Venture Brothers villain. Like a purple... Sorry. Yeah, uh, no, there, could be, there could be fun to be had there, but there is... The, the, here's the thing. Like, <laughs> there I, could be fun. I, I, I write, uh, r- write work for hire occasionally, and when yep. I do something Something like that i go oh that's funny it's kind of like prince okay well now he's a prince style character you know i will work yeah. some sort of element th- into that into it and i will just have fun and be like there it- his name is purple rain but it's spelled like r-e-i-g-n and exactly he's like yeah. a royal monarch with his guitar and he, right. and he wears blouses and it's funny you have fun with it you make you know david bowie has been in everything because people have referenced him and turned his characters into their characters in numerous times uh anyways i just think what's <laughs> So annoying about this is you he brings them in and then the classic fake out, the classic RL convenience occurs where he's not there. And then he runs to the to the uh, studio, as Kevin said, to find yeah. this character because he believes I saw him on TV. He has to be there, which when asking the secretary if the purple rage was on TV, she says, <laughs> yes, he was. And then he flew away. So we are to believe that the ca- the character, an evil superhero, showed up on a regular talk show, disappeared yeah. in the middle of it, and Conan O'Brien did not go, that's fucking crazy. He went- yeah, no, no get, one's reacting to he it. He said, quick, we gotta get Harmony Corinne out here to fill the space, because we- <laughs> And they got Harmony, and Harmony was hanging out, and got on, and got on air and tricked- it. Robbie's parents. Was it a local politician instead, or something. Like, yeah. uh, uh, Robbie, why are you making us look at That's uh, right. Mr. Was... Mr. Popledopoulos? Congressman yeah. McClue, uh, a name <laughs> that uh, fell out of RL's brain onto Maybe the page. Maybe take another stab at that name, uh, RL, on, on Mr. McClue. I, well, I, not just it's just the details of it. It's... Hold on. Is he talking to us? As Kevin said, is this a McClue for us to follow? <laughs> Could be. RL maybe wants us to save him. We're so close. We're so close to like my actual next like okay. psychological and I, I, I just want to point out the detail of it. It's it's just a very small n- nuanced thing. It is that when he shows up, Robbie shows up at the TV station, the receptionist is like, we have no idea what you're talking about. That sounds like a made up oh, thing. Is that right. a doctor? Right. And then and then Conan O'Brien's like, well, yeah, he was a guest on my show and he just left. Goodbye. Well, and her, then- her exact words were, are you making any sense? I don't think so. Uh, I and- quote, <laughs> a quote that I copied and bolded and put down and said, <laughs> RL, read this line to yourself a couple of times after you finish the manuscript, please. But you're right. Yeah. No, no. Conan is not reacting to the fact that a real life superhero attacked him, his desk. He's just like, gotta go on with my life. All right, go on. And I hate to do that shit because I know people hate it when you're like, when you take something too literally, that's obviously a children's story or a, a game or whatever. But sometimes you need to look at something and go, is the internal logic of this thing working? And here's the thing. This is a comic book that is written by a child. We are, we are, we know it's coming. We know the fake out's coming. We're so deep into it that we want to believe that there is some internal logic to this, but there is none. And it makes us feel nihilistic to sit there and to have to go through it and be like, he doesn't care. I, why are you, but, you're wasting my time. You're wasting my precious life reading these words right now. RL. And, and there's proof of concepts that have already come out at this point that show why this could work. Like uh, the mask, right? Jim yes. carries the mask is such a very much i don't know how much it holds up but i remember very clearly it is real people reacting to a guy who is becoming a looney tunes right right? or you Mm -hmm. have like Mm -hmm. last action hero which does both sides of a person from the real world or a person from the action world being brought in and how those don't mix for them so there's a fish out of water yeah rl could do any of that rl could do like just spitballing like Robbie shows up, he finds Conan O'Brien's dressing room, and Conan is like cowering in the corner, terrified because Doctor, you know, Purple Rage, terror, like right. threatened to break all his limbs. Yeah, yeah, great point, because he breaks into the office anyway. Have him break in and have him find 
the purple rage there. Kevin, to your point, I thought about this multiple <laughs> times through this book. This is something you've said to me. Don't make something almost happen. Make something happen. <laughs> and here's the thing. like He almost <laughs> discovers the purple rage threatening the threatening yeah. the, 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 the studio to have him show up in the middle of the important fun action instead of having him constantly show up after the fun action has happened and then stumble into the guy while he's walking down the street with his hands in his pocket whistling. You know what I'm saying? Conan's getting into his car could not be bothered. Could not care less that a a real life villain just attacked. Robbie and Brooke run up the <laughs> stairs of the TV station to try to catch up with the supersonic flying superhero that just escaped uh, minutes ago. Uh, they 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 are pursued by security uh, and Ro- Brooke is captured. Robbie falls off the top of the building, getting a fleeting glimpse of a purple speck in the distance, mm-hmm. and he is rescued by the villain Purple Rage, who then proceeds to throw him high in the air again for a <laughs> fake out, and then save him again for no reason because his character has no motivation and nothing. But he like Purple changed Rage... his mind mid throw. Like, yeah. I was like, I guess I'll catch you again. Purple Rage hates Doctor Maniac. Who and we have now spent more time with Purple Rage than Doctor Maniac. <laughs> this book could have been called Purple Rage. This book could have been called Robbie Schwartz versus Purple Rage, but uh, Doctor Maniac, I guess, is is who we're leading. He wrote up the title. To. He already emailed his editor, and he was like, "It's Doctor Maniac," and 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 the guy uh, Brandon Dorman had already done the cover. Drawing this mojo looking motherfucker coming out of the computer, so he had to commit to it. It's either that, there's two working theories. Either he came up with the title and he must stick by his title, or A B testing proved that Dr. Maniac sold better. <laughs> damn, damn, damn. Purple Rage takes Robbie to his Fortress of Solitude and throws him in a scorpion <sighs> uh, cage. <laughs> Because we have to have animal fear. We have to have an animal fear. Of course. Moment. Oh, and there's there's uh, there is a threat of a dog bite earlier in this. I don't even remember. I don't even remember either. There is, and it's gonna uh, that the, I want to bring up animal terror yeah. near near animal terror. I'll call it. Uh, yeah. N- Nat. Uh, yeah. Where it's not you don't get the actual animal attack terror. Uh, you get close to the animal attack terror. There are multiple instances of this, and then I, uh, when we get into the Harland thing, I want to bring that back. Uh, but I do have to say that this uh, this moment of the oh my god, scorp- we got to go back to horror land. This, just I know, I know. This scorpion, <laughs> yeah. this scorpion part gave us a great quote, which was, "I struggled to stand, but I slid and slipped on the wriggling hard bodies." Okay, great quote. Good job, RL. Great. Just to remind everyone what's happening here, Purple Rage is a character that Robbie <laughs> invented. Dr. Maniac yeah. is a character that Robbie invented. Dr. Maniac is a character that Robbie invented. Purple both Rage, villains. Both villains, because villains are more interesting, according to uh, Robbie. Robbie Schwartz is a self-insert character based on the author R.L. Stein. Right. <laughs> Robbie is literally being held captive and tortured by his own intellectual property in this scene. <laughs> yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's right. RL RL is crying for help. He feels trapped and he feels stuck and he feels like the, he has created a monster that he could not defeat. Is this kind of what the Goosebumps movie is, right? Is that a little bit of like, I mean, without I don't think the movie is trying to say that, but that Slappy and his former creations are dooming him and he's like I was, I was haunted by these things I've made. I'm Jack Black. <laughs> well, Give it a he's been making this call He's been making. He's been calling out constantly that this is the the horrors that he's living in. He's, he has said this many times. In, in those movies, Chad, uh, the R.L. Stein character is the master of those horrors. He dominates them by putting uh, them into the book. In uh, in Robbie Schwartz versus Doctor Maniac, he is the prisoner of of these moths of, in, of these in ideas a, in the Kafka esque terror of awakening into a new book created within his own mind each time. That is what that is the terror <laughs> it, that he's it, dealing with. No, right it's now. a great point, Kevin and Paul. At no point, and this is where the story really needed anything for for Robbie to have any sort of like agency as a character is use the concept of I made these things, therefore I know them. Sure, there's a bit of like, oh, I never wrote 
that he had this lab and a jar full of skeletons. The story is going beyond me. And my brain kept flashing to Alan Wake 2 right now, which is really yeah. the, the parallels of that. <laughs> right, um, right. And that's that could have been interesting, but he never explores that. He, he gets the closest to doing a literature in this moment, actually, when he throws him into the scorpion, the, the poisonous, <laughs> quote unquote, poisonous scorpions. Scorpions? Yeah. I'm going to get pedantic as fuck right now. Scorpions are venomous. And if you're an editor who worked on this book in 2008, that was your fucking job. So get with it, Scholastic. <laughs> We're like seven paragraphs into the scorpion cage scene before Robbie goes, oh, I just remembered scorpions sting. What else do you know about scorpions in your brain, Robbie? Like, what else do you know as a kid? So, it, it was, yeah, he does utilize it, but he gets close to a, a literature here where Robbie realizes this is the phantom rage. He only knows rage. I know how to defeat him. And then he starts screaming insults at him and he uses his knowledge of the character he created to defeat it. Finally, something about this character's traits creates mm-hmm. some forward momentum. Finally, the book uses the beat to move the story forward but, through the character's, yeah, yeah. Act, through the character's the, action, which is the most important aspect. But it's the level of, this character was called the Glass Smasher, and I'm trapped <laughs> in glass, and I realized, oh, Glass Smasher, you can get me out of here. It's like that level of connecting I know, dots. I know. He also gets to throw a scorpion at the Purple Rage, which I think is, is cool. And then he gets pooped out into the sewers and then goes home. The, sewer, the sewers take him exactly to his house where his mom says, you smell like shit and I hate you. And oh, there was a dead rat head for no reason. That was kind of yeah. a real little gory thing in this kid's book. Yeah. And there was, the, de- there was also the dead squirrel at the beginning that gets eaten by Dr. Maniac, a.k.a. I'm not crazy. I'm a maniac. It's fine, guys, because none of it's real. It's web. None of it's real. Right. <laughs> it's all webcomics. <laughs> So you know, uh, he he goes upstairs from the sewer. Uh, he goes, yep. or sorry, he goes. He his, he smells. His mom says, "Go upstairs and get a shower." He gets a shower, and then his mom yells at him further and says, "Brooks missing now too. You have two people missing. You left the house when 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 the kids were missing. How dare you?" And then then mom says, "Then mom says, well, better go out and leave you home alone. Don't sneak out again." Which he does. Yep. Well, he sees a new Dr. Maniac comic, a new DRM has dropped. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) And he's like, I didn't even make this one, but it's in my art style. And uh, he sees that Dr. Maniac has been, has a plan to kidnap children and force them to skate. This is the greatest thing. He's for, he wants them to skate. He's going to force them to skate. skate. He's going to force them to ice skate on skate rinks so that people will pay to see his ice shows when... You can just wa- simply walk down to your skating rink and walk in for free <laughs> and watch the same thing. Now, Doctor Maniac is a character that Robbie Schwartz, a sure. character who is the audio, who is the author insert character of R.L. Stein, yes. created, yeah. who is now tormenting him, mm-hmm. who has a plan to use ice skating, a pure activity enjoyed by many, mm-hmm. uh, for nefarious and uh, lucrative gains, and at the expense of hundreds of children yep yep and i guess presumably yeah if all i i know he's insane he's doctor maniac the plan's not supposed to make sense he's he's not crazy like, he's a maniac people would go yeah. and just pay him money to watch the kids and go all right well we're going there's my little boy out there in the ice i haven't seen him in six months boy he looks tired <laughs> all right going home you're welcome doctor maniac here's 20 bucks that's his plan but what is what is rl's business model if not taking something that should be enjoyed <laughs> by children and making money off of it in the shittiest way possible that shouldn't work. All right, you're making this book seem better than it is. I, yeah, this is it's this not is like good. what I it's, this is what I assume that documentary about the shining is. Uh, no, this is his cry for help. He knows. There's a part of him who knows. And like that's not a hopeful thing. I would rather imagine RL to be free as he expresses himself to be of putting Uh, his heart into anything he works on. But I think this book shows that there's a part of him that regrets, (laughs) like, like, (laughs) like knows that what he's doing is fundamentally wrong. And he's held prisoner by his own IP. And he's put in the scorpion tank by the characters and situations he's created. I'm ready to believe that RL was in a contract with Scholastic and he was trying like hell to be uneditable. He was he was trying to, to sink this thing from the inside. Now I'm ready. To, RL's a hero. What if we get to what if we find out at some point like oh RL was was trapped in an evil contract and he was really 
uh, it's like a record label where you're you're you owe nine albums, so you just kind of churn them out because he didn't want to. He didn't. He's going to put them out later. And he's going to call them RL's version. And, RL's and he's cuts. Gonna, yeah. Remasters. I, I'm, I'm, I know that's not exactly what happened with Taylor Swift. Um, but that version of in about like thirty more books, he's out of his contract, and that next new orig- RL original is so worth it. He's been storing up cool story ideas. Wouldn't that be great? No, it won't. Because that's not what that's not what happens, Chad. I know it's not he's what ba- happened. He's he's poisoned his own writing career by doing what he does. Like he cannot form a good story anymore because what he's been doing for the last thirty years does not resemble how good stories are made. He can only do this, and he's held prisoner by it. And that's what he's trying. <laughs> that's what he's trying he's to strapped express. himself to an infernal engine that must keep being powered, and he can't stop it, or he'll die. And um, okay, well, and then what happens after uh, Robbie is kidnapped or just bumbles into the ice skating rink or whatever? Uh, he's captured by Doctor Maniac and Scarlet Starlet, who exists. And I've been randomly mentioned multiple times as another villain, but yeah, I guess she's teamed up now. What's her deal? Like, she just wants attention. Like, that's the, I don't know what the superpower is there. She, but yeah, I don't even know if she has a line where she's like, she and does. The st- eyes will be all she on does. Me. She has, she has <laughs> one line, and that's well, one line about that, and then she has like another line later that has really nothing to do with. Okay, so she's sure she's vain. That's her. She, yeah, she's like Carmen San Diego or something. Yeah, um, but no, that's not fair. Carmen San Diego is great. But Purple Rage attacks, and yes. Purple Rage is defeated by Doctor Maniac and the Scarlet Starlet because they laugh at him. And this is one of RL's oh my god underlying principles: laughter defeats rage. RL is fundamentally angry at what he is forced to create. <laughs> at <laughs> what he is putting out, he has he he looks back on the stuff he's made and he's pissed off. But the only way he knows how to cope with a world that he can't connect with, a world that perpetually has a banana in its ear, is not to get angry at it, but to try to laugh at it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But also, also the story beat does nothing. You have Robbie's <laughs> about to get put on the ice, yep. right? Uh, oh boy and he sees other kids are there but he never mentions like do I know any of these kids are nope. they saying anything an older Goosebumps story like uh, Camp Jelly Jam would have like personified a few of these kids who are stuck in this weird hell of skating forever he doesn't have to pad time because like he, he doesn't a, need to he has a stupid Horrorland segment that writes its fucking self <laughs> <laughs> but and so instead, like it's like, oh, Robbie, you're about to have to put on the ice skates. You're gonna have to ice skate as well. Yep. Uh, that's when the purple raid shows up. Gets, I think he just pops. Yeah, he literally pops. Yeah. And so then it's like, well, all right, well that was nothing. So Robbie put on the skates. So like that beat didn't need to exist. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it didn't propel the story forward in any way. And I think that's half of the story is like. A thing happens, and we go back to where the previous chapter was. I think RL is afraid of his own anger, uh, and I think he covers that <laughs> with comedy. Am I speaking from experience? Perhaps. But I think it is significant that Purple Rage is defeated by laughter in, in um, this work. And I think- uh, Sure. I, I, th- I just think he's, I think he's tortured. I think RL is trying to break out. Paul? I don't have anything to say about it. I want to join in and say that 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 I, I Kevin, I love your theory. It's beautiful. Let's go. With <laughs> Thanks, that. man. So, so you don't have to. Again, if you don't want. <laughs> no, I love it. I do I, love it so much. Okay, tr- tr- I'm trying to. I'm trying to ignore. There's a there's a defensive thing that maybe none of Maniac stuff makes sense because that's his whole fucking thing. But for that's a story. Uh, now Maniac and and Scarlet uh, O'Hara from RuPaul's Drag Race are going to fight Robbie. And suddenly Robbie gets enough. He's like, oh, he's like, what if, what if we all just fought them? Yeah. Like, what if a hundred, what if there's 200 kids here? We could just fight these villains. You're like, yeah, they haven't really established the Dr. Maniac or Scarlet have any kind of powers. So, so that he, and what, and his idea here is utilizing mass action and, and, (laughs) and a walkout. And what if this is the moment to go along with Kevin's idea where RL is making a call to the children, (laughs) children, tell your parents. We're not reading any more Goosebumps books. <laughs> yes. The only thing that can defeat Goosebuds is if the children revolt. If the children stop yeah. buying them, we can. I can stop. You can let me rest, children. <laughs> and, uh, and so then the revolt doesn't happen. Yeah, the ice breaks. And we find out that Sam, uh, Robbie's brother, is Dr. Maniac and Scarlet is Brooke. Um and they escape into the cyber dimension. Because, well, don't, well, don't just well, yeah, don't just skip. Over. Why why were they this? 
why did don't worry about how they had the resources to do these things is because like like Robbie had said, he thought villains were more interesting and they wanted his attention, I guess, or they were jealous of him. Um, yeah, sure. It was a big ploy for Robbie to kidnap all of these kids and to hack the computers and make web comics and it doesn't matter because the cops show no, up. The cops they raid the whole yeah. place. They shoot they shoot Sam and Brooke uh about fifty <laughs> times. Their bodies go into the water and the red of the blood fills the water and all the kids are like, ew, grouse. But then like, you know what? two forms <laughs> of their bodies emerge from the bloody ooze that is filling the water and they t- they turn into digitized forms of themselves and enter a television that a, a jumbotron that is for some reason in this. Oh yeah, this J- jokes aside, Paul is not. Yeah, they literally just blip out of existence for yep. some reason. Well, because Robbie has to de- has to delete them. It has to end with Robbie, the creator, saying, "This isn't worth publishing. This is better in the ground and away from anyone who would ever read it than it happening again." And he hits the delete key. It w- RL is literally even, t- yeah. he's telling himself delete your post. <laughs> like he's- so but like you know, there's there's and read listeners, there is no nothing stitching these together of like, was there a magic computer that made things come real? Is there anything about how like yeah. Robbie's ideas are, are more powerful than the other? It is literally just they're from a computer so they could be on computers and then all Robbie has to do is go to a computer and hit delete. And then but but yeah. I, but it, like, here's the thing like okay let's let's go with that logic okay let's let that sure. logic ride well then we step outside because that is the end of the third Robbie Schwartz comic book and his mom reads it and says wow that was a really great effort Robbie you're very imaginative uh, it's really <laughs> sad that your siblings <laughs> that your siblings who don't exist I'm going to say that out loud so that the audience knows it uh, had to die. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Taylor, the, the the sister we mentioned earlier, didn't even need to exist no, anyway. Yep. She even has a a moment later where she talks about how she deserves a bigger part. Uh, yeah. So his mom, uh, you know, lampshades all the fact that none of that stuff happened. Uh, he didn't have those siblings. He's still a comics writer. And Robbie is a really imaginative, imaginative and cool guy. Uh, she leaves him alone. And then Robbie uh, opens up his computer to see... A, a message from Dr. Maniac. Guess what, bitch? Comics are real. And you are in one. <laughs> and you It's Tim Buckley from Control Delete. He's like, you gotta read all nine thousand of my comics. And it turns out that his brother and Taylor are still the evil characters that he created, and he is still inside of one of their stories. And oh no, you're invited to horror land. And I'd want to loop back and talk about the end of the story, and Kevin, I would love to hear how this fits into your into your hypothesis that <laughs> is definitely real. But internal logic, okay, sure, there is another layer of comic book or reality upon which upon in, in which Doctor uh, Maniac actually does exist, and Robbie is under his thrall. Robbie goes to Horrorland and says, "Well, it's a free trip to Horrorland. I might as well take it." And it's like. You're not even following your own logic. If you're going to set up that the twist at the end is, oh, shit, I am trapped in this world. Make him fucking force you to go to it. Do something with it that carries through. But it doesn't even, it's almost as if this idea for this, in fact, I know this is how it was. The idea for this first half was plotted and outlined. And the other half, the Harland half, was also plotted and outlined. And they agreed on this one thing. And he was like, well, I don't want to change it now. Fuck it, I'm just gonna go with that. Yeah. And I'll just change the it, logic it needed, of the entire story. I don't care. The the ending of the the ending of the the first story doesn't connect to the horror land at all. It needed to be almost like uh after you realize that the entire book you just read, reader, didn't exist, a on the computer screen, a cryptic text uh starts writing like, Robbie, you are a really creative, imaginative right. person. What you should do you wanna be really inspired? Come to Horror Land. But the fact that it's like Dr. Maniac and Scarlet Starlet inviting him means like, is none of this real? We're still, when this book started, we were like four or five fictitious like Inception layers in. Mm -hmm. And we slowly like came out one. And then you presume that we're out of the, we're, we're out of the Inception dream state at the end of where, right before Horror Land at the end of the, at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. But 
we're not because the last layer is our layer is is because rl stein is robbie he's still he goes to robbie goes to horrorland because in robbie's head he is still writing this and he is still like in the web comic and he can zoop out a, an inception layer at any time because there's always the top layer of rl stein looking over him does that make any sense because i hope it doesn't because my brain is overheating right now. It's requiring the, aud- <laughs> the audience to go, well, um, don't worry about any of that. None of that mattered. Aren't you excited to see Robbie go to Horrorland where maybe none of this is real either? I mean, also think about how none of these stories are real. So why do you even care about these people? Um, Robbie gets an invitation to Horrorland. He gets stuck in, uh, he goes to Werewolf Village but because he thought it'd be cool. But also there's Wolfsbane Forest. So I don't know, pick one RL. Um, and he runs into Carly Beth. And Sabrina Mason from the previous books, who are also lost in the forest, and they're like, "We saw some men in cages with snouts." And they're being they're being chased by wolves. So Robbie crawls down like a little mole and and <laughs> mole digs. <laughs> RL goes into such detail about yeah. the fact that he, he, he digs a little a, hole. He digs a little. He hole. shifts into a fugue state. By the way, he gets I have like an idea. It's like Robbie just goes. Something came over me. I started to dig. <laughs> He gets so like artistic at this point that like I th- I, I had to like reread to figure out what <laughs> was too. going on because I was I was skimming I, like I was just trying to get through this. I, and also, <laughs> Robbie is totally different in Horrorland. He's all quippy now, like a Marvel hero. Yeah, well, but he's writer Robbie, right? He's top level writer Robbie. So this yeah. is all the <laughs> all uh, he, he has. The, he's able to pull the uh, Whedon esque knowledge out of the world that he exists in with us to uh, to, to quip in this one. Uh, I-, I love that he digs it out with his hands, and then it is described that he puts his face into the hole and then uses his back legs to create a little mole <laughs> motion tunnel that he digs himself on. He digs like a goddamn mole. I and, don't think. And Carly, he... Beth, and Sabrina are both like, "This is the most attractive boy we've ever seen." <laughs> yeah, and and they're like, "There is no way a wolf could di- no, a wolf can't dig like that." <laughs> There's no way the wolves are following us past oh, this. Oh, th- this is, I know, I know, listener, we're being so hard, but there are there is multiple seems like chapters worth of them digging <laughs> while wolves just watch them dig. Like they're cornered already by the wolves at this point. And the wolves are just howling. They're kind of just like doing their idle animations while these kids <laughs> dig at the dirt. Yeah. We go to the game preserve where there are a hundred video games. Awesome. Cool. There, There's Pac-Man and there's Donkey Kong. And there's Dr. Maniac's World of Pain. So there's three video games. And what does that mean <laughs> that he has his own video game? It means that we get like a weird... Like he's trapped in the game, sort of thing. This goes on for wait. It goes on for so long. Uh, there are vampire seagulls in it. Uh, <laughs> the vampire seagulls who paradoxically shoot the very thing they crave out of their mouth. They shoot blood out of their mouth. They want that blood, RL. They don't want to be shooting it at kids. <laughs> That's valuable blood for them. That is a reverse vampire. I hate to tell you, RL. They crave the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's funny um, stuff. It's uh, it doesn't matter. I don't even it know. doesn't matter. The only thing that happens is she they bring they they climb through the mole hole. Someone trips. <laughs> they get up. That's a that's a cliffhanger. They get up. They run. Robbie trips. That's another cliffhanger. Uh, an important another cliffhanger, which is the same beat that just happened of a girl tripping. They go yeah. into the video game encounter vampire seagulls. He keeps chasing. Uh, he keeps chasing Doctor Maniac to rack up ammo points i've never given a scale <laughs> to know how many ammo points you need to buy ammo that pisses me off yeah this is some fucking uh like minecraft stupid like <laughs> so you can't just get ammo you have to like craft it with points and shit. <laughs> god even in 2008 they're obsessed with crafting mechanics and video games <laughs> yeah just like give me the fucking thing you know and then um <laughs> yeah and then uh slappy shows up Oh well, look, real quick. I just want to say greatest hits. He but nope. he, tr- he tried. <laughs> <Slap> to- <laughs> Leave it all in. Leave it all in. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Paul, Paul, Paul. you were saying. No, I, nope. <laughs> Slappy shows up. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the story ends. Goodbye, Goosebuds over. <laughs> no, there's a there's a token that hypnotizes you for some reason. There's a magic coin. It's gonna be important in three episodes. We cover it. We need to mention the magic coin. And Sloppy's like, Robbie, you need to hypnotize or someone has to hypnotize someone. Really, really hypnotize Robbie. <laughs> Guys, we're at rock bottom. <laughs> We've hit rock bottom. <laughs> This is <laughs> what does that even do? Robbie g- gets hypnotized and he blacks out and then he just reawakes and he's like, "All right, what's going on? Nothing happened." Like there have been hard times on this show before, we don't <laughs> <much> about <laughs> <laughs> but Horrorland is literally like dissolving our brains. When I'm reading this book, I can feel my latent ADHD crawling on my skin like <laughs> I, the I scarabs know. from the mummy. <laughs> Like, I, I, I have so many tabs open that I keep being like, now I have to look at magic cards because I read two paragraphs and they made me want to die. <laughs> please, if you've been reading a lot of Goosebumps, please, for the love of God, just grab another book and read it and just see. See yeah, what's we're, out we're there. We're doing the reading for you guys. You don't need see to, you don't need to read them. You're good. <laughs> they For some reason, like... Like they had to steal the coin because it's the token that um what the fuck dude had that made him win all the prizes or whatever, right? Yeah, like uh, it's no, not. Wait, no, it's wait, not. Wait, it's no, it's not. not. By- Byron had a card. Byron oh, had a Byron card. Had a card. Okay, and he, and he gave the card to a kid. I can't remember yep. which kid because these kids are so interchangeable. This coin is a new item. It's a new magic. Okay, item. there's a card and there's a token. So we don't know anything about the token. There's we, a card, there's a token, there's a lighthouse. He keeps there's always these things. He keeps bringing new things in at the start of each new Horrorland thing. He's like, meanwhile, while all this other stuff was happening in Horrorland, these characters went through this. I'm just, it's the Gundarks. It's fallen into the pit of Gundarks. It's just like, he keeps <laughs> doing that. I don't remember what are Gundarks. That's that fucking stupid line from the second Star Wars where they're like on the elevator and they're like, we need to prove that these two people have known each other for a while. I don't know. Say that he fell in a pit of Gundarks and that'll do it, right? <laughs> it is. It om- it's almost like RL was writing a ch- like a, a an adventure PC game, and these were all just the random items you were going to have to solve puzzles with later. Exactly. But exactly, there were parts of this that felt like when he was doing the video game, I felt like, wait, is this a discarded? Give yourself goosebumps. I thought that for a moment because it honestly sounded the way he would write one of those, and I feel like all of these bits are just like things he had sitting around from unfinished books that he was like, oh, I guess I could stitch all those together, and that'll make a book. And kids will like the fact that it's all that they have to buy 20 books to read it all, I guess. Slappy comes into this story and I felt nothing. It, uh, has Slappy, he, I can't even has, remember. Has he, he been, has been in the here. horror land story at this point? I guess he has. It was the first one. Yeah. The very first one. Yeah. So Slappy's got something to do with the story. But I genuinely don't think at this point in time when this was published, RL knew what Slappy had to do with the story. I would like to I would like to read all of the horror land books. I wouldn't like to, but I will. I will do this. I will read yeah. all of the horror land stories at the end. Don't. I would. I would. Don't. I, I would <laughs> don't like to know. I can't follow Paul. <laughs> That's our Patreon stretch goal. We hit a certain limit. Paul's gonna read all of them. I need to know. I need to read them as one and know if it makes sense. I need to. Paul, I think if you do that, your head's gonna blow up like scanners. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I'll have died for science then. <laughs> Again, I don't think RL read them. Like no. in a row, like I don't think he did a pass through to check and make sure that it flowed real nice. Can so, you imagine if he had like a massive storyboard in his house, like he just was tracking all of them? No, he was just like, oh goody, I get to write a first act again. <laughs> this character falls down. Can you? Can you guys know that Doctor Maniac's going to show up in two future books? Oh, Whoa! Boy. Oh boy, is that a threat? <laughs> yeah. Yep, it's a threat. Goosebumps Most Wanted and uh, Goosebumps Slappy World both have uh, appearances from Dr. Maniac. Next one's called Dr. Maniac Will See You Now. Again. Because he's a doctor. Dr. Maniac was barely in this book. We had we had way more purple rage, <laughs> purple rage. than Dr. Maniac. Who I guess exploded because he got tickled. Yep. So uh, what did we learn? Um, I 
I love you guys both so very, very much. <laughs> and I feel like we are bonded in war yeah. by these books. Yes. I, Chad, I can't speak for Paul, but I would like to say that I don't blame you. Okay. This is not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you i often i genuinely appreciate that i feel a lot of guilt about uh that message 10 years ago of like hey what if we what if we read chad, goosebump books i think we could call it goosebuds i thought of the title already chad i'm having a great time pumping my blood into this series with you our blood feeds this beast that we have created and i'm having a good time hanging out with you today was a bad day <laughs> Hey, you know, if if you are listening to this and you're like, I think Chad, Paul, and Kevin should take a, a small vacation break and read a different thing. Maybe a Choose Your Own Adventure book. Maybe read a other YA story, which I still enforce calling a Gulastic Book Club. Um, it's a name I've been putting on things that still hasn't stuck for Ooh. 10 years. Um, it's a show format. There's a really good way to do that. You could email us at goosebuds at gmail.com. But more importantly, you could use your support of the show on patreon.com slash goosebuds, where your pledge keeps the show going. It powers this blood engine that we are strapped to. Uh, but also, you can guide the direction of the show. We recently had a poll on what people wanted to read most and see most, and uh, a lot of you said Horrorland, so we're doing Horrorland. Um, but we're going to do some other stuff, too. Uh, so this is all kind of – some of you all yours fault. I think, <laughs> I think you know we're we're committed to doing Horrorland. We got to see it through. Like this we is have to see it through. You know, I, you know, I go, I I see things through. I'm not gonna. Yeah, we're no, we finish through. projects. But like, if you wanted to get us like a root beer, like if you wanted to make sure we could have like a frosty barks or mug root beer. Oh, that sounds so good. <laughs> to kind of assuage the mental trauma <laughs> we've sustained throughout reading Horrorland. You could give us a dollar. You don't have to give it us a dollar every month forever. You could just do it once so we can get a root beer. Give us the boxes. Give a us ru- a ru- where's a root beer cost a dollar now, Kevin? Listen, Where are you getting a dollar root beer? I'll get you a dollar root beer, bro. I'll get you a 39 cents root beer. Oh, shit. For <laughs> real? Yeah. It feels like an illegal Philly thing. Um, but that's again, you can go to patreon.com slash goosebuds. Uh, you get access to bonus Camp Goosebuds episodes every month. Uh, honestly, the middle part of this episode is the most Camp Goosebuds we've ever done, where we're just like, what is it to be a creator? Right. Yep. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. We, you're, uh, you gotta, uh, it's not always that existential, but that's essentially what we do. We hang out at the digital campfire and talk about other things inspiring us, usually things we're excited about. Um, you get access to dozens and dozens of those by pledging. You also get access to our cool Discord uh, and other neat stuff. That's at patreon.com slash goosebuds. Kevin, yeah. somehow with all of this, you also had the time to do a game jam. Yeah, there is a new Super Try game out. Uh, I made it as part of the Super Try game jam. Paul was a judge for that game jam. Yeah. Uh, if you want some recommendations of cool games to play, you can go to jam.supertrystudios.com and you'll see uh, a link to like what the judges thought of the games that were submitted. Uh, including my own. There's a new Super Try game to play that you can play. You can play it at supertry.itch.io or supertrystudios.com. Uh, it's called Bird Bulls. It's a game <laughs> where you are a bird. It's a great ro- title. It's Bird Bulls. It's Bird Bulls. I think I was I, I was like working on the game and I was a little sleep deprived, and I, the I had the little bird robot jump in a bubble, and I just went Bird Bulls to myself can you can you spell that out just for anyone who is oh, yeah. trying to google search it? yeah B- brd bls bird bulls it also just go to super try you can just google super try and play the first game that's on my page it's bird bulls it's bird bulls guys you can bird bulls um it's a, bird bulls. It's a, it's a nice little delight enjoy yourself with that game. it's a, you can be a bird robot uh who goes in bubbles and avoids spears and i think that's <laughs> I think that's okay. It's pretty cool. Bird Bulls. <laughs> it's good. Play my play my video game. It's fun. It'll, it's very quick. And uh, I think it's got good uh, mechanics and level design. And uh, the soundtrack's really good. And uh, the, the bird is cute. When I drew the bird, I drew the bird in front of uh, a couple of people during a panel. And uh, it's like, it's like, you know, nine pixels or whatever. And somebody went, ah, when they saw it. So I was like, yeah, that's it. That's the design. That means you're doing something right. Yeah. yeah it's cute. <laughs> Uh, Paul, what people check out? There's, a, of course, continue show. Yeah, you can watch me play video games. Uh, 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can listen to me try I, and recover from this book on another <laughs> show and do, do, doing something else. <laughs> I've been enjoying how like ornery the three of you on Continue have been getting for your sports games. I feel like a really like a really deep rivalry has 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 been set in stone there. I've been enjoying all the Japan only stuff you guys have been playing. Like I feel like you guys were like you still do dip into like the um the shovelware Wii genre yes. on occasion, which is fun. Like that pirate game you played was pretty hilarious. Yeah. But the the stupid pirate castle there crashers are- thing. There are two angles that are going into continue. One is Nick going to the video game store and looking through <laughs> shitty Wii games and picking out whatever <laughs> looks the shittiest and bringing that back. And me uh, hanging out, looking up Japanese games and watching Sean Shonson videos yeah. and learning about the strange, uh, not strange, but the unknown <laughs> Japanese video games that are out there that uh, we can just play now because I have a mister. It's beautiful. I almost asked if Sean Shonson was from Philly, but then I remembered his accent. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, the... The accents are similar. Hey, yeah. Paul, when are you guys going to play Bioshock Infinite on Continue? <laughs> we already did on our Continue cast many years ago. Did you really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was actually listening to old Continue casts on the plane ride over to Boise. Aww. and Boise. And it was uh, it was great. <laughs> it was a good little walk down memory lane. Yeah, I'm going to check that down. I, yeah. uh, I, I, you should listen to it because we really wax philosophical on it. And I think if I were to go back and listen to that now, I'd be like, we were given that game. A lot of narrative credit. I, but to your point, Chad, there is a lot of fun stuff in there. There's a good, there's good theming in there. But uh, I understand it's a flawed game. I just want to see, I just want to see you guys like go through the let's play and make a really tough choice on like, will you throw the ball at the interracial couple or will you not? These we are did, the tough questions. We did not let's that's play it, Chad. I'm sorry, you're not going to get to see our unique reactions to that. But <laughs> but we do talk about that moment. I'm sure in that in that episode. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you could you could look, look, go watch continue show. Uh, there will be some other stuff hopefully coming out in the nearest future um, that you could check out. Um, I I am working on all kinds of projects, uh, but they none of them will see the light of day for a little bit. So uh, just go watch continue if you want to hang out with me some more. Chad, you been doing the dungeon dragon? I have been doing the dungeon dragon. Um, r- dragon, dragon, rock the dragon. Um, <laughs> I've Dragon been playing Ball with Chad. Dragon Ball Chad. Rest in peace, Toriyama and me. Yeah, you can go over to a uh, friend of our sh- friend of our show, Holly Comrade, has been started up a new D&D campaign called Black Staff Academy, uh, where I am playing a character named Crispin Crumbles, a, uh, a young wizard uh, trying to find the ultimate spell that will put him to sleep because he, he suffers from night terrors. Um, I mean, he's does, a real sweet boy. Does level one sleep not work? on him uh well i mean it's it's not gonna be long enough you know oh, what i mean I I yeah, need, yeah. i'm, I'm sur- i think i'm searching for like an odin sleep yeah. uh for my character i just really wanted it was inspired actually by a um you're trying to rip van winkle yourself very much it was inspired by years ago went out to renaissance fair with i think dom and came up with the joking character of a sleep mage and it just made us laugh so much um that i've been i've been role playing that uh the other characters are not sleep mages they're very fun other wizard schools kids uh it's kind of like wizard school dairy girls Ooh, um and then i'm fun. the only boy in a group of girls and holly counterheads our dm uh kayla klein who does our goosebuds merch is also one of the players and uh katie and hadil are also two great wonderful players you can find that on uh bird holly on twitch or holly conrad's youtube channel on bird holly they have vods of the replays the first couple games it's uh, Holly Holly studied under Chris Perkins from Dungeons and Dragons mm-hmm. on how to be a DM, and she is very very good. Ooh, so cool. check it out. Hell yeah! I bet you can also find it just by googling Blackstaff Academy too, right? Yeah, I think that'll be probably the easier thing to do. Blackstaff Academy. It is a canonical uh, academy in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, including Gale from uh, Baldur's mm-hmm. Gate uh, <laughs> is a teacher there. Uh, we're very excited to run into him. That's the guy who eats shoes. <laughs> yeah, he eats shoes. Uh, he's got his his cats there. We've already run into his cat. Oh, Tara. Yeah. So uh, if that if that if that sells it to you, Gail might show up. Chad, your your characters are always so delightful and always have such a quirky motivation that I find always incredibly endearing. Uh, great job. Yeah. Oh, thanks, guys. I loved Reader. He was your last uh, mm-hmm. public Reader character. was. A f- I missed playing his Reader in my Warforge. Yeah, uh, that was very fun. Uh, but yeah, check that out. We're going to do a camp every other Sunday, roughly, but find them on the YouTube channel. Uh, I think that's been a hell of a goosebuds, guys. Me too. I think it also was. <laughs> and I was there too. <laughs> and, and Paul, Paul's here. 
We all made it to the end of this podcast. You included, listener. Nope. Slappy shows what? up. No, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time. We'll see you guys. Love you all. Goodbye. Bye. 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 This episode of Goosebuds was brought to you by our lovely patrons who we enshrine here in our book of names. The book of names. Starting with Stefan, Jive, Turkey, Kubara, Low Belly, Hate Me, Hollis, Hornbeak, Cameron, Murphy, Audio, Michael, Mick, Dowell, Hey Josh Rob, Mickey C, Nathan Dolezal, Mike Lanteri, Buddy Morrill, Alcade, Mel Dipson, Afshin, Dango Twist. Zentacles. Stealth, a beautifully fleshed skeleton baits. Mm. <laughs> Robert Moon. Brian Wells. Jason Crooker. Clay Castle. Miguel Pardo. John Keedy. Calf. Right Aid Sucks and Bring Back Paranoia Shop. <laughs> Neither of those things are ever coming back. <laughs> well, right Aid is gone. They got... They got rid of Rite Aid? I don't know. I feel like Rite Aid's been, like, absorbed at this point. I could be wrong. We're living in a Walgreens world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Juggalobalist. Gregory D. Warren. Cody Redfield. Bradford Coulter. Aiden is taking karaoke suggestions. Bang on uh, my drum, uh, Matthew Wilder. <laughs> The the impression that I get. Oh, I know. My, my, my boss owns. <laughs> I said bang on my drum, Matthew Wilder. That, I'm thinking of Philadelphia Man. Uh, uh, I love Philadelphia Man. Todd, Todd Runger in Philadelphia Man is bang on my drum. Uh, I was thinking of uh, uh, Breaking My Stride by Matthew Wilder. Ain't nobody gonna nobody break gonna my stride. Nobody gonna break my stride. Nobody gonna jar jar slinks. Nice. Chosen one. <laughs> Levithan. Up and champ. Jonas Eggman. Carl. Anthony Mulberry. The John D. And Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Elusive Koala. Yanni Markovina. Brooke X. Jesus Christ. Christian Van Skyver. Jeremy Lowe. Brian Hobgood. Zach Connor. Patreon underscore donator, comma, yo. Joe, spooky digital ghost, Tierney. Tom Whittem. Andrew Jadzak is now betrothed to the entity under <gasps> the ice. Wedding will be held upstairs. Uh-oh. Oh, we got an ant next? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I thought the upstairs area meant above the ice, but maybe, yeah. uh, maybe, maybe oh, we have a balcony. Oh boy, that's scary. That's a scary bit of lore building. I didn't realize. Oops. Lord Cornwallis. Carson Birkenbean. Murphy P. Sean Minogue. Tevin Ticklebean's arrows tend to find nuts. Wow. Threatening. E. That's the uh, Chad was reciting the emoji that was on the end of it with that. Sound. Yeah, that was the E. <laughs> Rushy Glenn. Wiggle it. Luke LaFountain. Chip Handsome. Matt McClellan. Tanya Turtle. Alicia Grafe. Juan Jalapena. Keith Halcrow. Timothy Misadolakis. Clay McCarty. Reinfected. Ham underscore boat. Raymond Hernandez. The Crow Fans, but seasonal. Matthew Sutton. John Barber. Jeff Coffey. Kelsey Kinneman. They go, they go well together, Kinneman and Coffey. Russell Casberg. Mm -hmm. Xavier Jimenez Castillo. Chris Putrakis. Scotty Pippen. Sarah Kemp. Jonas Blotterman. Flemily. Tobias Clark. Dungeon Kappa. Ice Descendant Hamster. In the ice. <laughs> part of the ice. Whoa. That, that, well, that makes sense, though. That makes sense. Yeah, we, sw we swapped the hamster and the entity <laughs> for the wedding. Annex Ascendant Hamster. <laughs> up in the annex. Playing Beyblades. <laughs> Zach Weir. Limp Duck. Meet Virginia. Alex Moon, the robotic dog. Joe Regular Name Scott. Estamena, Lord of Paul's Pants. Chris Phantasmal Nightclothes, Bonnie Nelson. Bonnie. Luke Canoodles. Streak. Hugh Bolin. Zambambino. Kieran McNamara. Diet Soda. Lamb. Jackie L. <laughs> Goldman Laguza. A pair of Scots. Levi Kidder. Gidden Frisky in the Lobster Bisky. David Gray. For sale. Infinite Jest. Never read. Damn. <laughs> a millennial. Damn. A millennial. A millennial's obituary. <laughs> Damn. That's the sassing Paul's ever heard. <laughs> Bryce Deury. Matthew Bertado. Nathan Remick. Jonas Ennevolson. Need more kimchi. Lee Wood. Bony. Reed Steubendeek. Some of Chad's bird friends have left the Midwest <gasps> and returned to the Northeast. Wow. 
Oh, they'll come back. Joe Gorman. Joey Evans. Burger's Wonderful World. Nicholas Maloney. Andre Villanueva. Carewise Gamgee. Eric Horwitz. Tiffany Lee. A wild, swaggy Yolo Squire appears. Cameron Hansen. Thomas Jancis. Lucretia McEvil. Mutant Astronaut. Henry Torbear. Ah! Generally depressing. <laughs> The Deadly Bulb. Boner Guard, Epsilon Hamilton, a.k.a. Hambone, host of Radio Bone Air. Adam Knapp. Ben Bohan. Logan Dirt. Brad Schmelzer. Chick. Tacky Tammy. Anthony is out of fun names. Check out the Chronicles of the Avatar novels by F.C. Yee. Rise of Kyoshi is great. I, I don't know what any of that means, but sure. I'll... I have th- I have that on my nightstand to read. I will, Anthony. Me. Callum, Mr. Misfire West. Mandy Nasty. Skeletoran. Calamity Carl. Germ Deuce. Yoplin. Nick Johnson. Philip Reynolds. Neat Bit G. Mr. You Grate em, I Grate em. Unimportant. Whoa. That was cool <laughs> as hell. Boss Garrison. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a killer teacher. Ryan R. Davis. Scott Wable. Ryan Carroll. Jeremy Bowser. Rocco! Oh, Magal, Magal. Hi, Josh. Hi, Josh. Hi, Josh. Mag and my Carmack Mason. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Avdog. Ninja Breadman. Heloticus Frenchly. Aaron Lloyd. Llama Lad. Dr. Chalk. Keeping it simple. Greg Musto. Robo Terrana. <laughs> <laughs> SSJ Trojdor. Yeah. Hi, fierce time, long time. <laughs> Ellie Roos. Speak the beans. Now we're just going to go Swedish with it. It all, it all boils down to Swedish. It, after all, it all turns yep. Swedish. Ollie Sutz. My cart. Mike Spaghetti Jones. Cassandra Harris. Gulliver. Red Baron. This next name is my favorite. Big Nick Lane. Kira and Brian are big fans. I, I love how that works out. Yeah. Delta 8 made Steve Buscemi into a chili making god. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Is that weed? Is he, are they talking about weed? Oh, maybe. maybe. Delta 8 a kind of weed? I don't know if that Blake makes Blake Cavan. Soggy newspapers. Chris Kulik. Dakota Kemp. John W. Farrah to- <laughs> Saturn video. Quest, comma, humbly asks whoever reads this for a goblin to grade. Oh, jeez, man. I mean, you've seen them all. <laughs> We're running out of goblins, Quest. There's, there's a limited amount of Can't them. Can't make them fast enough for you. What about the green goblin as played by Willem Dafoe Perfect. in the Sony Spider-Man movies? In a sense, every Willem Dafoe character is another variation of goblin. So pick one of those. Yeah, see, tell me if you think of the poor things, Willem Dafoe, how oh, he boy. would be as a green goblin. Franken goblin. Yeah. Now Chad says Jesse. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> Jesse. Chris Kerr. Cole Gleason. Kiwi of Lerv. Serial Killer X. Jesse Box. Michael Malloy. Kyle O'Neill. Kit Bush. Sirison. Dennis Wright. Yover the Moon. Cameron Ganseveld. Anthony Stoker. Brony Danza. Tan your hide. Wonderskin. Rat I R L. Max de la Fontanelle. Dog Lips underscore Crojoyan. <laughs> Wonderskin again. <sighs> Joel Frostine's Ice Mega Church. We're taking you down, Frostine. Oh boy. <laughs> but thank you for your support. That's a good name for an Ice Mega Church guy, is Frostine. Yeah, it's like our antagonist for sure. I like him a lot. Like, I might switch. Matt Scepter. <laughs> don't you don't go to their church? Greg Gervasi, aka Vita Z. Paul Sentient, my buddy doll, returns. Hurt, aka Cyberbully. Kevin said heaven can't be found after seven. Tonight at 11. Crap. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Rodriguez. B. Blarbin. Vindictus, the patron of decision books. Ooh. We met him. Uh, Jeff, parentheses, big baby, and his wife, parentheses, not a big baby. Odin's eye hole. Ugh. <laughs> it's just it's old, smells, soggy. It smells gross. Yeah. S. Logan Kilgus. Creature of the office, Boss Feratu. Starship Nine. Turaku, the thing that goes doink in the anime. Doink. Spencer Y. Greb Bomix. 
Whoa! <gasps> a comics that are bombics? Shadow Heart Gun D Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> Canadian ghoul learning Mandarin, their third language. Whoa, Damn, I don't even have one. <laughs> what? Yes, you do, Chad. Captain Billy Beard Myers. R.I.P. Adam Tedderis, friend of the show, had no fear and thus did not burn at the touch of man thing, <laughs> but was shot dead by John Darniel dressed oh as. My God. Oh, oh, as what? As. We'll never know. But John Darniel always appears dressed as someone you love. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next month to find out who it is. He takes the form of someone familiar with you, like the like the alien from Contact. Yeah. Or maybe they're just dressed as L.O.D. <gasps> Come Quat Behavior Podcast. Clint Deer King. Agents Miskatonic. Nail Seven. Angelo Edward Longton Santone. Smellities. 3 a.m. sleep. Spencer Leaf Johnston. Ben <laughs> Sawyer. <laughs> Caleb Snyder kept forgetting to change his name. Lumo Nuva. Brian Udath. Bob Cabbage. Herpy Derpy Drowns in Dumb as <laughs> Shit Sauce. Rip. J. Farr wants to know Does this riot bus stop at Ice Church? <laughs> riot bus! Riot, riot bus. bus! Just drive riot. straight into the Ice Church. We have an open air uh, entrance for you. Riot bus for life. Jolly old jewels. Number one gnome. Nowhere Lucas. Brian Sturrup. The Shrek Ronomicon. C.L. Reagan. Ryan Coyle. Justin. MC Wright. Taylor Garofalo. Jaybird. Nintendo 60 Jorts. Tickass Biddies 007. Nat underscore Noah. Jorge Raya Navarro. Jacob Leach. Sorry, I was distracted by the next name. Jacob Leach. Mimal the Delph. <laughs> Jim Corey. Daniel Lavelle. Quinn. Jackie Bay. Olympia Streets. Oh, Spaghetti the Yeti. And now we oh. welcome in new blood to the Book of Names and new acolytes into the Ice Church. Lee Murphy, which way does your cup flow? Tootin Watson, I hope your cup tilts upwards. Hi, Wyvern. <laughs> Carly Beth's parents, 808. We know you weren't allowed to sign <laughs> Carly Beth up unless she had uh, free reign to go to the annex and play Beyblades. And welcome, steamed ham. I hope if you're steaming, you keep yourself off the ice and on a nice, like, heating pad. Touch the ice. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for your love and support. Thank, Thank you. you.